Most regular people and even photographers don't know what infrared photography is, which I think is regrettable considering how freaking cool it is. If you clicked on this video purely because you saw the pink and blue photos and thought they looked really cool, I don't blame you, but that means I should also explain what infrared photography is. Every digital camera since the late 1990s has come with an IR or infrared cut filter, which basically cuts out all the infrared light and produces a normal looking image, considering that humans can't see infrared light. So this was added to improve the color accuracy of these early cameras, as for example if you shot a picture of fire or in really high UV conditions, it would produce really weird orange and purplish looking images which weren't appealing. But the cool thing about digital image sensors, CCD and CMOS alike, is that they have a lot of flexibility. You may have heard that the space telescopes like the Hubble and James Webb can see infrared, which allows them to produce, capture more light and capture really psychedelic looking galaxy images like this. But you're probably wondering, if humans can't see infrared, then how on earth are we able to actually view these photos? Well, that's because infrared photography in general is a form of false color imaging, much like how thermal cameras have false color imaging to show the heat of the something. But if you already know what infrared is, then you're probably familiar with this pink and blue aesthetic that many of the infrared photos online have, so I'm going to take you through how I did that. First of all, I took a perfectly functional DSLR and disassembled it completely, so that way I could access the image sensor, which is actually kind of cool looking. And then I decided to take a pair of scissors and literally cut out the IR cut filter. However, doing this alone won't get you the cool infrared pink and blue flowers aesthetic. You have to do a bit more work. First of all, you need to get a filter. There's lots of filters you can choose from. Some of them range from 480 nanometers all the way to up to 800. And they have their different use cases. Generally, 750 and up is good for black and white photography, and 480 to 600 or so is good for color photography if you want those really cool false colors. I chose a 550 nanometer filter, which is the best for getting those pink and blue photos. It looks kind of orange, and that's because that's what it looks like to human eyes, and even through shot through a regular camera, it just looks orange. But it actually lets in a specific frequency of infrared light and blocks out all other visible light. Without a filter, you have a camera, what we refer to as a full spectrum camera, which captures basically any and all light that happens to reach the image sensor. The filter just happens to get that specific infrared look. Full spectrum, though, can be really useful for applications like astrophotography, where you need as much light reaching the image sensor as possible, and infrared isn't necessarily something you don't want in the image. However, once your camera has been converted to IR, which I highly recommend doing professionally, not by yourself, because you could break an expensive camera that way, all you need is a lens to shoot with, and personally, I recommend ultrawides. This is the Leoa 15mm f4 macro, which is actually a really unique lens in its own right. On APS-H, it goes down to 19mm, but that's still pretty wide, and it's great for landscapes. However, once you've taken your first few photos, you probably notice that they don't look anything like those cool pink and blue photos you saw online, or the black and white dramatic ones you might have been looking for. And that's because these photos need a lot of post-processing to look correct. Honestly though, I'm still trying to figure out how to make these photos look kind of like good at all. It's kind of like you have to go through every single photo individually, you can't just throw on a preset on every single photo and expect it to look correct. But generally speaking, to get this kind of photo, you need to swap the red and blue channels, change the color temperature up a bit, and make sure to tone in the highlights. As far as shooting techniques go with a camera like this though, it kind of just really depends on what you're looking for and what kind of environment you have around you. Since this is a macro lens, I thought it was really cool to get some ultra-wide macro shots, which ended up looking way cooler than I could have imagined, kind of like phone wallpapers or something. But what's really interesting about a camera like this is that it kind of almost promotes you being lazy because because a lot of the shots you see in visible color look way cooler in infrared, and you don't even need to try that hard to get a cool looking shot. I'd also recommend trying and shooting a little bit underexposed or getting some bracketing shots, so that we can stack them later in post to get an HDR effect. I think it makes the photos pop even more than they already do. It's also really cool to shoot rivers, oceans, lakes with these kind of cameras, because even if the water is completely brown, it's capturing the reflection of the sky and making it look crystal clear and blue again. Also, just go shooting on a day with a really high UV index. That's when there's going to be the most infrared light and you can see the most dramatic difference between the pinks and the blues in your photos. What I don't recommend shooting is like dirt or nothing that's like foliage because it just doesn't look quite right. And while portrait photography can work, I generally think it looks best in black and white as the color just looks weird. But with that, I'd like to show you some of my favorite shots I got with this setup.
I'm sure you can see now why enthusiasts of infrared photography like it so much. It has such a unique aesthetic that you can't get from literally any other camera. And this has been a thing even before the digital age. Kodak Aerochrome was famous for being a nice infrared 35mm film stock. And it's one that Grainy Days apparently really wants them to return to. It makes even the most boring scenes look absolutely exotic. It's actually kind of crazy how effective it is. It probably leaves you with this question though, should I get into it? Well, it kind of really depends on what your situation is. If your main camera is like a really nice Sony a7 IV and you don't have any other backups, then I say that's a no-go, honestly, unless you're super rich and want to pay someone $300 to convert it for you and be stuck like that. <laughs> because while it is true that you can put the ground glass back into a camera and even get filters that just cut the IR for you, it's never going to be quite as good as the stock one that was just meant for the camera. If you want to get into it now though, I'd recommend picking up an old DSLR that you can convert yourself if you feel confident doing so. Or I guess if you have the money to blow, then that's not really a problem for you, I guess. But with that, that has been our pink and blue nonsense lesson for today, and I hope you guys have found something else new about infrared photography you didn't know before. And with that, this is Calc G, out.